we have made a couple, for me, very fun discoveries. So one has to do with the notion of observation. What does it mean to observe? What, what, what will it mean in our theory to for one system to observe another? In, in you know, classical physics, the observer um, is not much mentioned. And if they're mentioned at all, they're assumed to be objective and don't really interfere at all with whatever it is that they're... So they, they, they don't disturb whatever they're observing. In quantum mechanics, um, there isn't a theory of the observer, but but it's it's known that you know somehow the measurement process um, is a destructive process. I mean, it, things are different when you measure than you know when you don't, and and so there there's this feeling that you know the observer has to play a role, but it's not formalized, right? The, yeah. the measurement is formalized. You know, it's some kind of there is a formalization there in terms of positive operator value measures and so PLVMs and so forth, but but. You know, even someone like Chris Fuchs, who's saying, you know, that the, it, that quantum mechanics is really just um, uh, a description for the agent, how it should up, update their beliefs in, in in light of experimental data and so forth. But when you ask him, so so what is your theory of the agent? He says, I, I don't owe you a theory of the agent. I'm just telling you that quantum mechanics is the manual that the agent should use. And I don't know what an agent is. And I respect, I mean, you can't do everything. And he's doing quantum mechanics and he's not doing the agent. He's not doing the observer. But he does say that the agent's important. So, so then in our theory, then you know, the question comes front and center because we're talking about conscious agents all the way down. So we 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 can't avoid. So when we talk about a measurement, we have to actually have a theory of what does it mean for one system of conscious agents to make a measurement on another system of conscious agents, right? What what does that mean? And we use, so I have to be a little technical to, to explain the idea. I'll, I'll try to be as untechnical as possible. But we use Markovian kernels. So a Markovian kernel basically says, suppose you have um, a system that, that can see three colors, red, green, and blue. And that's, that's what it experiences. There's a kernel that we call the qualia kernel that describes the sequence of color experiences that this observer might have. So maybe if I see red now, the probability is that the next time I see a color, it'll be green, but maybe it's, a, maybe it's half. And it's also a third that I'll see blue, but it's also, uh, you know, whatever is left over, probably that I'll see red. So I can say for, for each color I'm now experiencing, what is the probability of the next color I might experience? And you can, so when you write down a matrix, a, a, a table of all those probabilities, in mathematics, we call that a, a Markov kernel, and it, it's it's actually a, a linear operator, um, and and you can actually study the properties of that linear operator. It, it, it can rotate vectors. It can exchange, you know, expand and contract vectors. It, it can do all sorts of things. So so that's the one of the models we're using to represent observers and the conscious experiences that they have. What we discovered was, and this is a new contribution to to Markov chain theory, apparently. To the mathematics of it is that well first first what i'm about to say is not a new contribution it's a standard notion in, but we're going to use it for the for the new contribution if you take one markov chain like it has three colors and and you've got the markov chain on it but then you say what what if i you know don't look at the red i don't care when the red i'm only going to look at the green and blue and i'm going to look at those two colors um what Markov chain gets induced on those two colors from the bigger Markov chain and red, green, and blue, right? You, you know, there's some probability of going from red, green, blue, but what happens if I only can see the green and the blue, I'll get some chance, you know, if, I'm, if I see green now that I'll see blue next, if I see green now, I'll see green next. So, so I can actually, you can intuitively, you can say, well, yeah, you should be able to induce a Markov chain on the smaller number of, of states, right? That, that just from the, and, but it would somehow respect the bigger, the bigger Markov chain, right? So that's the idea of a trace, it's called a trace chain. Well, what we proved, um, um, this is work with uh, Chaitan Prakash. Uh, so he and I worked on this together. And what, what we found is that the relationship of being a trace chain to another Markov chain is a partial order. That, that means that it, we found a, this is an entire logic on the space of all Markov chains, all Markov kernels. So this is a brand new logic. One one in one chain 
entails another if it's a trace chain of the other. That's that's the, so I can the actual definition is simple. Once I've told, I can actually say the def. So one Markov chain P is less than or equal to Markov chain Q if and only if P is a trace chain of Q. Mm -hmm. And you can prove that that is actually a, a, a partial order. And it's a logic. So it's actually a, a logic on the space of all Markov chains. It's not Boolean. It's, it's more general than Boolean. It's more general than um, quantum logics, uh, ortho complemented lattices. It's, this is more, it's more general than that. It's locally Boolean. So every particular Markov kernel, if you look at all the ones that are less than it, all the ones that that it, that are less than it, they form a Boolean logic. So this is a locally Boolean logic of observation. And, and then we proved that this, if, if you take, so, so by the way, then this is our notion of observation. If one observer's kernel, or Markov chain is less than or equal to another, then it observes the bigger chain. So that's so that's how you, that's what. So notice our notion our notion of observation is not this objective. You're you're outside the system. No, no, you're you're immersed in it. You are part of the system. You're an integral part of the system that you're observing. So so at the top level, that's the the take home from this. Our theory of observation is the observer is no scientist. That's you know, separate from everything and not involved in anything and completely separate and can't and, and can be ignored. No, 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 you are intimately part of the system and you must be understood to, to get a real theory of observation in science. You have to understand what an agent is and how it's embedded mm -hmm. in the systems that it's observing. And this is this gives a mathematical logic for, for doing that. So it's really, uh, we're, we're pretty excited, but, but then each Markov chain, um, if, if 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 you have Markov chains that are like re, uh, recurrent communicating class, so they're, they're in some sense they're they're nice they're nice Markov chains. I'll just use the word nice as a non technical term, but I gave you the technical for those who want the technical recurrent communicating one recurrent communicating class. They have then a probability measure that tells you long term what are the probabilities of the different states that you'll see. Like what was the probability of seeing red? Maybe long term you see red a third of the time blue two thirds of the time and green you don't see hardly at all. Maybe maybe that's the long-term problem. It, that's called the stationary measure of, of, the, of the Markov chain. And so it turns out that when you have a big measure and then a trace, uh, I'm sorry, a big chain and a, and a trace chain, that the stationary measure of the trace chain is exactly the restriction of those, of the, of the stationary measure of the bigger chain to the, that sub subset of states. No, in other words, it's all compatible. So you have a big measure for the stationary measure of the of the big guy, and maybe three of the states are what you trace on. Well, if you look at the, the big guy's probability measure on those three states, that's exactly what you get on the little guy, just renormalized so that it's a probability measure. You have to renormalize it so it's probability. So all of these stationary measures are, are they follow through this logic. And so, and it turns out, this then means that there's this this um, logic that we discovered on probability measures that, that I published 30 years ago, and it's 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 um, it, I published it with Bruce Bennett, who's a, uh, he's now dead, but a, a brilliant mathematician, and uh, Parish Murthy, who was a, a graduate student in mathematics. So it's two mathematicians and, and a flunky me <laughs> working on this, thing. and and we, well, we published it in the Journal of Math Psych, and. What we what we proved is that there is a logic on probability measures where one probability measure um, implies another or entails another probability measure, if and only if it's a normalized restriction. So I, I get the bigger probability measure. I take a subset of its states, renormalize the probability on that, and that's the probability of this guy down here. Okay. It turns out that's a, so. It's a simple idea. You know, I'm, I'm just a normalized restriction of the bigger measure, but then I that's the implication relation, and that gives you a non-Boolean logic. That's it's um there's no global complement just like in the by the way this trace logic there's no global complement okay locally there is because you have a local boolean um logic but globally not so it turns out now this last thing I'm about to say we haven't proven yet but we're going to try to do that there's a homomorphism of the logics that the trace logic is essentially homomorphic to the what we call the Lebesgue logic yeah. of probability measures so this gives us 
the trace logic gives us a formal theory of observation and the Lebesgue logic of probability measures gives us a formal theory of um, probabilistic belief. And so putting them together with this homomorphism shows how observations are formally related to probabilistic beliefs. So this is for us uh, a major breakthrough in, in terms of the formalism. And, and we had to go after this because, you know, you mentioned our, our paper on uh, the subatomic world, you know, so conscious agents in the subatomic world. Well, we have to say what we mean when we're talking about modeling observations of quarks and gluons inside the proton. What, what do we mean? Well, so now we have this. We, we mean that we're going to be positing some bigger Markov chain, and our observations will be some trace chains right, of, of that bigger chain. And the trace chain will have two, two ways that it's doing this observation. One is um, the number of states that it's tracing on, right? So that's going to be one parameter. The more states you trace on, in some sense, the better spatial resolution you've got, right? Right. So the so if, if I have, you know, if my big chain has a thousand states, that would be a very big chain. Mm -hmm. Um at least for my computer. <laughs> um, and, and suppose I, I have a trace chain that's only 10 states versus another one that's 100 states versus another one that's 500 substates of the big chain, right? The one that's 500 substates is in some sense a higher resolution observation than the one that only has you know 50 states. That, the 50 state one is, is uh, observing the big one, the, the big thousand state one. It is, it is observing it, but not nearly with the resolution of the you know 500 state one. And, and for the physicists, this is this would be our quantification of what they call Q squared, which mm. is their technical thing for um, uh, spatial spatial resolution. It's, it, it, it's tied to the amount of energy that they use. I mean, higher energy leads to better spatial resolution. So what we're basically now doing is identifying higher energies with greater spatial resolution in our trace chains, which is that 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 itself is a non-trivial statement. 